Community plays a huge role for Becky and I. Uh, we moved to Jacksonville to be near family, and three years after moving to Jacksonville, we now find ourselves in Jacksonville with no family. So community for us is crucial. Um, it's also crucial for my daughters. They get to meet other kids, uh, other moms. Um, that helps me know that my wife and girls are plugged in. My wife and I, we are a part of separate life groups. So we actually, we tried to do a life group together, but with two little girls, the timing just didn't work out. It was really difficult. So we decided to go it alone and it's been really incredible. So I am part of a men's life group on Friday mornings and my wife is part of a mom's life group uh, during the week. So our Friday mornings men's group is, is really dynamic. Uh, it's guys at different seasons of life. So we're all not going through the exact same thing at the exact same time. Um, we have college students, we have guys in the middle of their career, and then we have guys uh, that, uh, you know, I hate to say towards the end of their career, but, but it, it's, it's a really diverse uh, group of guys. So we get to explore and share with each other our successes and our failures. We get to learn from each other. And uh, it's definitely not a surface level group. Um, there's a trust there. Uh, each guy, in my opinion, is, is pretty open uh, to, share, to share wins, losses, hurdles, successes, and, and we just help each other out. Uh, in the midst of all that, we've, we've all grown to be pretty good friends. Community thrives uh, when it's intentional, uh, when people are completely uh, bought in and devoted to it. Uh, so supporting each other, uh, carrying each other's burdens. Um, helping each other out, motivating each other, and just being actively involved in each other's lives. Uh, so most of that happens out of church, away from Sundays. So community tends to fail uh, when there's a lack of trust, right? So uh, when people aren't fully open and engaged with each other, uh, that tends to, to be a little rough. Um, that being said, we're all people and we fail each other all the time, right? People are not infallible. So uh, I've been part of communities when that's happened and I just have to remind myself, uh, you know, we're all sinners saved by grace and we're all gonna disappoint each other. So don't whitewash all of the good because of a bad circumstance. I started serving here at Beach on the First Impressions team, and that was incredible. It just connected me to a lot of happy people. <laughs> One of the things that my wife and I enjoyed so much about our first visits to Beach were just the smiling faces, uh, the warm handshakes, uh, it just the happiness was almost tangible. So we felt called to then be that to new people. I then began serving with Beach Kids, and that's been a game changer for me. So working in Beach Kids, I've never volunteered with children before. Uh, someone approached me, asked me if I'd be a storyteller, and I tentatively accepted it, and it's been the, the greatest thing that, that's happened to me in a long time. I tell you what, on Sunday mornings, hanging out with our kids, our teens and young adults, uh, seeing their infectious enthusiasm towards Jesus and the gospel, um, I tell you, it's probably the perfect antidote on a weekly basis for my adult cynicism. So I love it and uh, selfishly, uh, I don't want to quit that anytime soon. Community is, is so important, I believe, to us accomplishing uh, the call that God puts on our lives that uh, I don't think of it as an option, it's more of a necessity. Well, welcome to week three of our series, We is Greater Than Me. And if we've never met, my name is Jerry, and I'm one of the pastors here at Beach, fresh off of vacation and excited to be back and preaching uh, here today. And uh, we've had a great start with Pastor Kerry preaching these first two weeks. It's been awesome to see what God's been doing. And uh, hey, if uh, you have your Bibles today, I want to encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 12 in the New Testament. Romans chapter 12, that's where we're going to uh, wind up here uh, in just a moment. This whole series, though, has been really about the fact that God has created you and me and wired us for community. There's something innate inside of every single human being, no matter where you're from, no matter what you do for a living, uh, that, that just desires to be in community. That's because God put that in there. 
And that's a part of who we are. And uh, we've all seen it. I mean, we're one of the most connected generations ever. And yet also one of the most lonely generations. Because in the midst of all the technology, we've forgotten how to really be authentic, real community together. And we've even seen from uh, all kinds of scientific studies that lives that are in the midst of community, even though it sometimes gets messy, thrive. But, but lives that are isolated outside of community, we've seen so many of the adverse effects, you know, physically, mentally, and socially. And so this whole series is about uh, how God has wired us to be in the community, and there's something that happens when we come together that you cannot do on your own. So now, I want to share with you today that if you're a, a non-believer or maybe you're just kind of checking out the whole faith thing, I want you to know that um, some of this stuff that we talk about in this series about relationships is still going to be absolutely practical and very, very helpful uh, in your family, in your circle of friends. And so uh, it, it'll be important just to really lean in to see what God has for us. If you're a believer, if you're someone who follows Jesus, then um, this is absolutely vitally important. Because you see, we can have all the friends in the world, but do we have a circle of those who are following after Jesus in our lives where we're helping each other grow to become stronger in our walk of faith. So what I want to do today is um, last week, Pastor Kerry talked about be intentional about the people you surround yourself with, that the people you do life with are oftentimes going to impact the direction of your life, right? He who walks with the wise grows wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. So be intentional about who you surround yourself with. The people around you matter. What I want to talk about today is that you matter to community. What you bring matters. Because you see, isn't it true? In every relationship you're in, you have no control over the other people, right? But you do have control over how you live in community, how you have an attitude towards community, how you approach it. And I love that, that, that Clint did the, the, the video this week because you can tell, right, he is all in. He is dialed in, and it sounds like all the guys in his group are really committed to taking their journey together and being in community. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to use a sports analogy um, to kind of address this today. And uh, if you're into sports, you, you've probably heard it said, bring your A game. And what that means is simply bring your best to the field, bring your best to the court, bring your best to the team. And what I want to do is focus on three verses out of Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. And uh, I want to set up the context for you as to what, um, what's happening in these verses. So chapters 1 through 11 in uh, the book of Romans. Romans is one of the greatest books in the New Testament. If you haven't read it, it is one of the most fantastic books to show us what God's grace is all about. And uh, in the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters are all about the gospel. And if you don't know what the gospel means, it simply means the good news. So what is the good news of our faith? Paul spends 11 chapters talking about it. And probably the best verse out of those 11 chapters to describe the good news of our faith is that uh, God chose to reveal his love to us in this, to demonstrate his love for us in this. Uh, Romans 5.8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The good news of our faith has nothing to do with the good you've done in the past or the good you're going to do in the future. The good news of our faith is what God has already done on your behalf and mine. Jesus took on flesh. He died on a cross. He was raised on the third day. He moved, God moved on our behalf when we least deserved it, when we were lost, when we were moving away from God, when we were in open rebellion to God, God moved on our behalf and he made a way 
for anyone who would trust in Jesus to experience forgiveness of sins, a brand new future, a reset, and eternity. And so um, that's what all is described through the first 11 chapters of Romans. Now, chapter 12, Paul takes a turn here. And you can tell it by the very first verse of Romans chapter 12. Here he's going to say that um, because of, in view of God's mercy, in other words, because of what God has done, what I want to do is take it from belief to the practical aspects of your everyday relationships. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto him. Uh, Your bodies is a very practical way of saying everywhere you go, in every relationship, take this mercy, what God has done for you, and live that out in your relationships. So, verses nine through 11. The whole chapter is gonna be about community, but for the sake of time, we'll just do these three verses. Starting with verse nine. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. I love that word, fervor. Serving the Lord. Verse nine, let your love be sincere. How do you bring your A game to community? Whether it's your family, uh, specifically to your life group. If you're in a life group or you're getting ready to get into a life group or you're getting ready to get back into a life group, how can you let your love be sincere? The word for sincere there in Romans 12, nine is anupocritus. Anupakritas, which is a word, if you took the, the, the root of that word, it's the word we know as hypocrite. An just says without, hypocris, without hypocrisy. So what Paul is saying is let your love be without hypocrisy. In those days when, when actors used to act in the ancient theater, they would take a mask and they would put it over their face to represent the character they were playing. It was pretend, right? They were playing a role. They were masking who they really are to be someone else. And what Paul is saying there with this word is don't let your love be hypocritical. Don't let it be pretend. Don't mask who you really are in relationships and in community. So how do we love without hypocrisy? or pretense. I got a couple of suggestions here tonight, today. Bring all of you to community, including the mess. That's one of the ways you can bring your A game to community. Bring all of you to community, even the mess. And here's why. It's impossible for us to really love each other in the context of this agape, unconditional love if we're not even shooting straight with each other. If we're not even being real, if we are pretending or hiding or masking who we are and what our struggles are. See, church people like to fake it a lot, right? We fake it all the time. You go to life group or you come here to church and somebody asks, how are you doing? Say, oh, doing great, doing fine, blessed, the Lord's good. And then you go get in your car and you fall apart because it's not real. You've you've done image control here to make everybody think you got it going on. Then you go home and there's chaos. And it's like you're living two separate lives. So the question is, who do you bring to community? Your Instagram profile or the real you? We often talk around here saying it's okay to not be okay. Do you know when people get real and transparent, that's when we know whether we believe that or not. Because agape love is, I'm gonna love you even when it gets hard, even when it gets difficult. How will we ever know if we live pretending to be someone that we're not, hiding the mess of our lives? If we continue to pretend all we are is a superficial, surface level acquaintance group. Um, 
The life group that I'm in right now was um, started, we started back a few years ago when we did a series called Rooted Here. And uh, in the series called Rooted, about the fourth or fifth week, uh, the theme for the week was spiritual strongholds. Now, if you don't know what a spiritual stronghold is, it's kind of like a pattern of sin that eats your lunch every time. It's that pattern of sin that has many of us maybe in bondage. It's something, it wasn't like a one-off thing. Oh, I cut someone off in traffic. No, it was like, this is something that you've been struggling with a long time. And it has a lot of us in bondage. And some of the most difficult places in life are because we're under some kind of this spiritual stronghold in our lives. And so can you imagine, we're like week five We hardly have taken off the cover of getting to know each other, and now we're going to talk about our spiritual strongholds. Now, here's one thing I want you to know. Whenever it comes to sharing even the mess of our lives, obviously, you have to use some discernment, right? Trust is not built overnight, but over time. And quite honestly, you know, trust and and sharing a lot of the junk of your life Quite honestly, it should not happen on social media. Don't vomit your whole mess in front of social media because you're going to open yourself up to all kinds of responses from people that don't even know you, that don't know your situation. But is it important to share some of that mess with people that love and care for us within a group that we want to grow in our faith? Absolutely. And so we got in this group and uh, we're starting to talk about spiritual strongholds. And the first guy says, yeah, um, I tend to kind of cut people off in traffic and I um, sometimes get a little angry when I'm driving. And and the next guy goes, I've missed two years in a row. I haven't gone to to my child's open house and I feel terrible. And then the third guy says, my wife says that sometimes I'm selfish in my marriage. The fourth guy said, guys, I struggle with pornography and lust and have for a long time. And all of a sudden it got real. All of a sudden, it was like this this sigh of relief. We can actually be real with each other. We can actually talk about the real stuff that we're challenged by. It was like a game changer for our group because then we began to really talk about the things that we really struggle with and the mess that we're in. And sometimes I wonder, why in the world do we ever do that with each other in Christian community? Because if you buy into being a Christian, you buy into the fact that you needed a savior, that you were a mess and you couldn't do it on your own. You couldn't save yourself. And so Jesus did that for you. And then somehow, once we believe in Jesus, it's like we try to just do image control and try to pretend that we're someone that we're not. We all have mess. And so when you begin to really deal with some of the things that really matter, some of the struggles that we really have, that's when we begin to be a real community who loves sincerely. I think the other thing about loving sincerely would be this. Don't be a pretender when it comes to love. Don't be a pretender when it comes to love. You know how you do like a lot of times in in life groups, we'll do like, oh, let's tell everybody our prayer needs. So someone usually in the group writes them all down and they may or may not email them out to the group. But we pray for each other that night. And, and, and then we like, we like go away and it's like we forget the prayer needs. And we go off and we do life on our own and then we come back the next week and because it's that time where we pray for each other, then we'll pray for each other again. Or or that guy in your group that says, I really struggle with some of the career choices I've made. I'm having a hard time. And you say, man, I have gone through the same thing. Hey, let's get together for lunch sometime and we'll talk about it. Give me a call. And then he calls you five times that week and you decline every time. And then you see him the next week and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. And it's like, yeah, I know I was busy. I'm sorry. I didn't get your text at first. You know, you do all that kind of stuff. Or someone in your group is like, in your community, your circle, is sick or a loved one dies or they're in the hospital having surgery and you may or may not send them a text, uh, you, you know, but you, you certainly don't show up. There are no meals made. There's no like real, I'm gonna 
be here for you. Not just, I'm going to say we're here for you. I'm going to be here for you, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's difficult. You see, if, if we continue to kind of live out community that way, what happens is that it begins to look not like sincere love, but fake love, pretentious love, convenient love. Do you know what the branding of the early church was? The branding of the early church was to an outside world, they so stink and care for each other and love each other, it's contagious. So you see, when we miss that, if we miss that, we miss everything. See, we will not build a true sense of community with love that never delivers. Christian community is built on what Christ did for us. And the sincerity of his love is found in the cross. Because you see, agape love is love that loves in the trenches of life. I love you when it's difficult to love you. I love you in the midst of the mess and the brokenness. It's not always gonna be easy. But man, when you bring that to your community, when you bring you and you love sincerely, it begins to change the group. Another thing, Paul writes this. This is kind of an oddball, outlier scripture. You think, why is it in here? Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Why would Paul throw that in? Here's what it literally means in the Greek. Be horrified by what is evil. Be glued to what is good. Here's what I think Paul's trying to say here. And this is gonna push a little bit. But I think sometimes we get, you know, people, especially when you're in a church that emphasizes the grace of God, Sometimes we get so comfortable sharing the mess that we get comfortable with the mess. And it's like week after week, we share the same stories and we come to the same conclusions. It's a mess. And sometimes there's not an urgency about one another's lives, right? It's, it's almost like, you know, we're caught up in, in, in for, for some people, you know, they're caught up in this cycle of something that looks like it's, it's on a downhill spiral. And that the very people that love them and care for them just kind of watch them keep them going down this slippery slope. And sometimes we miss what it means to really have an urgency about the thing that, that Jesus didn't come just to forgive us of our sins. He came to change our lives and our futures to help us to become someone that we are not yet. And in community, what that means is that we help each other grow. And that means that there is a real urgency and and, and not a complacency about evil and the things that would tend to hurt each other and tend to be destructive in our lives and that we would have a heart for, for taking next steps to grow in our walk of faith with each other. It's kinda like, I mean, those of you that have children, right? I mean. Tommy's out in the street playing in traffic. Someone comes in. You got to come get Tommy. He's playing in traffic. And you're like, I'm really busy right now. I'll be with you in just a minute. We just got to let Tommy be Tommy. You know, Tommy needs his space today. You know, I really don't want to hurt Tommy's feelings. No. You run as fast as you can and you snatch his butt out of the street. Right? Because someone you love has put themselves in a very difficult and possibly destructive place. And yet sometimes we just grow so complacent. Now it's important to love each other through it all, but but then to just continue to, to repeat the same cycles and not take any steps of faith. The resurrection is about that there's a there's a new day that can happen. But it won't happen if we don't learn in our groups to speak the truth in love. You see, the Bible doesn't call a believer to judge the world. But that's what we do all the time. They didn't sign up to place their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But you did if you're a believer. 
But what we are called to do is hold each other accountable because we're on this same journey to try to grow in our walk of faith, to be on mission as people together. And that won't happen if we don't have sometimes some awkward conversations, some uncomfortable, some of the best conversations that have been pivotal in my life have been some of those awkward conversations where people spoke the truth in love to me about me. And they did it with humility. They did it with love. I knew they cared about me. And they kept me from some pretty significant train wrecks in my own life. And so Paul wants to remind us, don't grow complacent in your circle of of how you grow together. Don't go complacent with sin and brokenness, but be glued on what you can do to move forward and take steps forward. Then he says in verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. The word love there is like a family love. Be devoted to one another like a family. And here's what landed on me when I thought about how do I bring my A game to community? Devotion starts with presence. Devotion starts with presence. The truth is there are a lot of people in this world who want meaningful community. They want friendships. They're tired of being lonely. It's just that many of us are not willing to invest in relationships. You got to show up. You got to make the investment. You've got to give and spend your time in relationships that are going to matter. See, don't ever get caught up. This is, whether it's family or your life group, don't ever get caught up in the lie that says, oh, well, we may not have quantity time, but we have quality time. I promise you, you need both. Don't ever fool yourself into believing you can have meaningful intimacy and community life with other human beings if you're not committed to both quality and quantity of time. See, nothing says I'm devoted to us like showing up and being present. You don't get meaningful community when you're always MIA. It just doesn't happen that way. See, the enemy will source you with a million different reasons to avoid community, right? I'm too tired, I got up too early this morning, I gotta get up too early tomorrow morning, I've had a long day at work, I've had a bad day at work, I'm not feeling it, I'm hungry, I'm late, so therefore I probably shouldn't go to life group anyway, right? A million different excuses. Why do they come so easily? Because that's the way the enemy works. You know what the Bible says? The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he would devour. Have you ever watched animal shows? Who gets devoured by the lion? Not the one in the herd, the one, the outlier, the one outside of community. That's what the enemy wants to do to you. That's why the the reasons and the excuses always flow so easily. Don't go there. Show up. Show up and keep showing up. You miss a lot of moments when, you know, it's like you miss one week and then it makes it easy to miss week two and then you miss week three and then week four. It's like, I don't even think I can show up there again. They're probably gonna be mad at me for not showing up. So you you come up with every reason in the world. And so it's so important that devotion begins with presence. Devotion begins with showing up. Then Romans 12, 10, he says, honor one another above yourselves. Honor one another above yourselves. The the, the actual translation of this is lead the way in showing honor to the others. To the others. We live in a consumer culture where everything is oftentimes focused on what's in it for me, right? And that's where we oftentimes go. 
You see, honor starts with true engagement on behalf of the other. Honor starts with true engagement on behalf of the other. And you know where that started? Jesus. You see, we seek to put others first, to value others above ourselves, not because they're more valuable, but because that's what Jesus did for us when he took on flesh and he suffered and died to save you and me from our sins. He put his deal, your deal ahead of his deal. And so when you go to group, here's what honor looks like. You show up like you're getting ready to meet with royalty, right? They're not just Joe Schmo and Cindy Lou. You're getting ready to meet with royalty. These are people that matter so much to God that Jesus gave his life for them. When you come into community, you're meeting people of extravagant value. And not only that, when you show up, you listen when someone else is talking. You're not there texting with someone that's not even there. And you're not there thinking of the next clever thing that you want to say to add to the group. You honor the people. One of the greatest ways that we honor anybody these days is when you stop and you put your phone down and you look them in the eye and you listen as if what they are saying really does matter. You empathize in order to understand. You value what everybody contributes in the group. You stand with each other, even in the difficult times. You pray for people in your group as if they're the most important people in the world. Here's what happens when we really give ourselves on behalf of other people. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, I love this verse. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. In other words, the person that prospers is not the greedy person, the self-centered person. The person that actually prospers is the one who is giving of themselves. And the one who refreshes other people will himself or herself be refreshed. That's the way that it works. So what if we became a, a culture of people that really honored and put value in the others instead of always looking at what's in it for me? Because that's what the culture is gonna tell you to focus on. And let me just offer this. This is just a tangent. It's not really a tangent. I'm, I'm intending to say this. We're getting ready to enter into the school year. Everybody's pumped, ready to get back into life groups. We're doing Financial Peace University. I can't read minds, but I can read some of your minds. Some of your minds are like, I've already taken it. I'll just skip out for eight weeks, nine weeks. Some of you are thinking, well, I don't have a problem with my finances. I pay all my bills at the end of the month. I've got a savings account. You see, that's kind of like the me focus. But if we're in it for each other, what that means is, it's eight weeks. I can travel that journey because maybe someone else in my, in my group needs to hear something about my experience that can help them. There's possibly something I can do for someone that's on the verge of financial ruin or they're locked in bondage financially that could use what I bring to the group. So what does it mean to honor people in your group? It means to value others first. And then next he says, verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Have you ever met a fired up person? I don't even care what field it's in. They're just fired up. So I, I, there's someone like that in my life. His name is Phil. Phil, he's my coach at, at uh, TFW where I go to work out. And I've known this guy for like six years and I've gone in to work out at times where I'm tired, where I'm angry, when I'm cranky, when I'm hangry, when I, you know, I've just got all these, you know, my body just doesn't feel like it. I'm thinking about how old I'm getting and, and, um, or, or I'm pumped up and I'm ready. I don't care how I've arrived. For over six years, this man is 110% for my health, 
and my physical fitness. 110%. I don't care what I bring to the table. He's always on go. And um, even this past week, I was uh, in one of the classes. Uh, it's men and women, but in one of the classes, I was the only guy in the class. And we were doing weights that day, and we were doing bench press. And so Phil came over and spotted for me. I bench pressed, guys, 10 pounds more than I have bench pressed in a long, long time. And I'm convinced, I swear it's because Phil was the guy spotting for me. Because you see, sometimes, I see it every single time I go in there. I just get, I could come in like, you know, like this, and I just get caught up in his draft, right? He's just like, boom, 110%. I just get caught up in that draft. What would it be like if you were like that in your life group spiritually? Spiritual fervor, just your heart for Jesus. Doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you got it all together, but you are so on fire for what God wants for that group and what God wants in your life that you just come, you arrive like that. People get caught up in your draft of who you are seeking to follow after Jesus. I wanted to kind of finish with, there was a, um, when I was on vacation, um, the first three days, or three of the first days we were on vacation over the mountains, we invited two of our couple friends uh, to come and join us. And we've done some traveling together. They didn't even know each other, but they both knew us. And we've just become real good friends. And, and we travel and do some things together. And they, they came. And we're sitting there up in... Um, up at the house trying to decide, okay, what hikes we're gonna do and we're gonna see some waterfalls and all that kind of stuff. And one of my friends, George, and George is like, I've known him for over 20 years. And that this guy is just a spiritual giant. And, and uh, we started talking about what we were gonna do. He said, hey guys, what if we mixed it up a little bit? What if when we went on the hikes and we got to a waterfall, we just stopped at the waterfall and we all got together and we prayed for our children. One family at a time. And me being the spiritual giant I am, I'm thinking, why can't we just hike and see waterfalls, <laughs> right? But I didn't say that, right? <laughs> image, image management, there we go. I didn't say it, but I did it. And it was awesome. And I pray for my kids every day, but something happened in that circle when we began to pray for each other and, and there was like weeping and, and we had real honest conversations about our children. And then it was, if that wasn't enough, George said, hey, I got this other idea. Let me just kind of MC it for the whole three days we're here. I'll just at random times say, okay, we're going to pick a person and we're just going to encourage them. Once again, I'm thinking. Now, my love language is words of affirmation. <laughs> but I'm like sitting in a group and everybody's looking at you and they're saying all these nice things about you. And once again, I was just kind of, but I did it. Guys, for three days, they were three of the most meaningful days I've had in community in a long, long time. And it's because George fervored me. I just got caught up in that draft. All of us did. And when we went there, something beautiful happened. You can't control what anybody else brings to your group, to your community, to your family. But you can, with God's help, be responsible for you. Because what you do matters to community. So here's the way I want us to finish today. I don't know kind of what your response is to this message, but we're a very practical church. We like to be very practical in the way that we respond to the message. So, you know, the band is going to come back up. We're going to sing our last song. And here's the deal. For some of you, your next step is to go right back to the Connect and join a life group. You have a lot of friends, but you have no circle in your life to help you grow stronger in your faith. For some of you, you stepped out of life group and it's time to step back in. I don't care how long you've been gone. I'm just proclaiming it right now. September, <coughs> national come back to life group without judgment month, okay? So you come back, no judgment. And if you don't like the one you're in, get in another one. 
But don't allow yourself just to remain isolated from community where you can grow stronger in your faith. For some of us, we gotta just stop hiding our mess and get to what's really important in our life groups and in our families, in our communities. To trust the grace of God, that God's big enough and our group is big enough to handle the mess and let's just get on it and pray for each other and really stand with each other and see God do something special moving forward. Maybe for some of us, it's just God, you just need to come up here and pray, God, help me to love people like Jesus loves me because my love is very convenient. It's all about me. I just need to learn what it means to love people sacrificially like Jesus has loved me. For some of us, it's um, maybe it's in your life group, no longer just kind of creating this environment of complacency around the mess. You know, and it's okay, I mean, God's gracious to all of us, but at some point, if, if we don't start speaking some words of truth into each other's lives, we're gonna see some people crash and burn. And I hope and pray that our community would learn what it means to speak the truth in love. Maybe for some of us, it's um, just renewing our heart for Jesus. That um, you wanna be that kind of person that, that people... It's a contagious kind of passion for Jesus. And um, the place to begin is maybe at this altar, just saying, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I want to pursue you again with, with fervor. I want to know all that you have for my life. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing our last song, and you feel free. If you want to come forward and kneel and pray, you can. Uh, If you're with your life group and you want to do that, you can. Um, If you see your life group leader and you want to pray over them, you can do that. But let's use this time to respond to what God might be calling us to do in community. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you have allowed us to do life together. God, it's miserable to do life alone. And there's no way we can ever really grow in our faith until we learn how to do it with other people. How can you learn to forgive if you never have to forgive? How can you learn to practice grace if no one ever opens up and shares their mess? How can we ever learn to love sacrificially when we take the easy road to love? God, we pray that this would be a moment that defines this year for our life groups, for the communities for which we are a part. And God, this one's not about what anybody else will do. This is just about what I will do, what we will do as individuals to bring our A game to community. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?